The essay right now I'm going to be going over is by a, a prominent ethicist in the English-speaking world, namely James Rachels, and it's called Egoism and Moral Skepticism, and it's very largely uh, here be, because it's to contrast with um, with the, the views of the previous lecture, uh, that is Harry Brown, uh, that the views of Harry Brown in, uh, in The Morality Trap. Now, what James Rachels is going to do is he's going to criticize every form of egoism he discusses. You need to know that. And you're going to need to also know this lecture and the essay on which it's based uh, thoroughly. Why? Well, you'll need to know, know it thoroughly, the essay and the, and the lecture. Now, why? Well, you'll need to know it thoroughly if you want to do well on the third uh, test, because a lot of questions are going to be based on the, the essay in this lecture. Okay. okay, so James Rachel's, to a large extent, is criticizing Harry Brown's point of view. Uh, now, so James Rachel's first discusses what is called psychological egoism. Now, I think that a very popular, probably the most popular form of, of, of the theory says that all people always do what they believe is in their self-interest. Let me say it again, that all people always do what they believe is in their self-interest. Now, first of all, that's a that embodies a universal generalization. Second, it's a descriptive theory as, in fact, as are most psychological theories, not a prescriptive theory, which is to say it's purporting to describe how people, in fact, act and are motivated, and rather than saying this is how people should act and be motivated. So it's descriptive, and furthermore, in the form in which I presented it, it embodies a universal generalization, and it says that Again, all people always do what they believe is in their self-interest. Now, if you went up to Rachel's and you said, James, Professor Rachel's, what do you think of this theory? He would say, well, I think it's, it's false as a universal generalization. But if you were to trim it down and qualify it, and you said, well, most people most of the time are very largely self-interested, he would agree. And I think he would even say, that that's not necessarily bad, that most people most of the time are largely self-interested because you, you want people to have at least some degree of self-interest. Um, you want people, now why is that? Well, it's because that if people are going to succeed in this world and create value for others, they need to take a certain degree of responsibility. They have to have a certain degree of self-discipline and they have to value to some degree their long-term happiness. Um, and so, uh, and off, now think about it. It's often true that uh, that people can create value for others as they're pursuing their own interests. Right? A professional athlete may love professional sports and is typically in this society well paid, and at least for many sports. And so, and yet at the same time, that person is entertaining millions of people, creating value for people who are. Uh, in any way associated with the sale of the products associated with that person's name or team. And so that person is creating uh, happiness and value for others as well as uh, him or herself. Okay, so, and this often happens, that people uh, do what makes them happy and uh, they're often make, helping other people to become happy as well. And so, uh, so Rachel's doesn't even have a problem really with the idea that uh, people can pursue their own self-interest without necessarily harming other people. But he does object to the universal generalization that all people always do what they believe is in their self-interest. And he thinks it's just simply false. He says sometimes we do what we think is right even when, even when we don't necessarily believe it'll help our self-interest. In fact, we think that it may even detract from our happiness sometimes people will do what they think is right. I mean, sometimes there are some really extreme examples 
of people who will risk their lives to save strangers. And I don't simply mean professional rescuers, such as uh, firefighters, but I mean people who just uh, happen to be uh, where there's an emergency and they run to save someone at great risk to themselves, whether someone, uh, a stranger is running into someone's home, uh, some home that's on fire, or whether somebody is uh, in uh, some very cold water because of a plane crash uh, in or outside uh, the Washington, D.C. This was years ago, and kept on throwing the line to, to save others, and then ended up drowning himself, uh, other people who were passengers on the plane. Um, but what I'm saying is that uh, I, what I want you to understand is that according to Rachel's, uh, although it's true that most of the time people aim at largely at their self-interest, it's not true that they do it all the time. And moreover, Rachel says it's a good thing that people are not always exclusively aiming at their self-interest because he thinks that, that a sound morality will require us, at least on occasion, to subordinate subordinate our interests uh, to uh, those of others. Okay, so uh, again, Rachel thinks that if you really uh, are objective and you really examine the evidence, you'll see that sometimes people will neglect their self-interest for the sake of others. Okay, now Rachel gives this anecdote. We don't know for sure, and Rachel's doesn't know for sure, whether the anecdote is historically accurate, but it, it could easily be true. And it certainly uh, does a good job of illustrating his point. And the anecdote is of President Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln, as you may know, was a very bright guy. He was well-read, very highly intelligent, uh, and uh, a skilled lawyer, good at debate. Presumably, at least according to this anecdote, he is engaged in a kind of a philosophical discussion on a stagecoach, which is uh, in transit, which is moving. And he looks at what is the discussion about? It's about psychological egoism and whether it's always true that all people always do what they do because they believe it's in their self interest. Now, by the way, I need to say something here. Psychological egoism doesn't say that people always succeed in promoting their self-interest, because then it would be obviously false. But it says they always try to promote their self-interest. They always do or try to do what they believe will promote their self-interest, but they can miscalculate and sometimes uh, do something that clearly doesn't promote their self-interest. Okay, as when someone overdoses on drugs but didn't intend to overdose on drugs. Uh, but anyway, so let's okay. Let's get back to this. So we've got Abe Lincoln. We got a, we have him in a stagecoach. <clears throat> He's defending psychological egoism, as I've defined it. The person with whom he's having this discussion is interlocutor, of course, dissents from uh, Lincoln's view. And while they're having this discussion, Lincoln sees uh, out of the stagecoach uh, window. Uh, some piglets and the mother sow caught in a ditch. What he does is he asks the stagecoach driver to stop the stagecoach, whereupon Lincoln gets out and frees the piglets and the, the mother, the sow. When he gets back on the, in the, to the stagecoach, his interlocutors turn to him and look, he goes, look Abe, you've just falsified or refuted your own theory uh, because you helped those pigs. You sh okay, you showed a concern for something outside yourself. To which Lincoln replied, no, I didn't falsify or refute my theory. If I had not helped those pigs, I would have felt bad. I would have had a pang of conscience. And that would contribute to his displeasure. Okay. Well, Rachel says we should be suspicious, not not of Lincoln saying that, that he felt good by helping and he would have felt bad by not helping. We, we shouldn't be suspicious of that. But he says we should be suspicious of Lincoln's reply as, as somehow trying to strengthen psychological egoism, saying that people are always exclusively self-interested. Because 
what Rachel says is, well, look, if Lincoln really were totally self-centered, why would he even expend energy to help the uh, pigs? The other people in the stagecoach didn't do anything. Wouldn't it have been easier for him just not to help? Now, notice Lincoln didn't say, I help the pigs to forward my reputation as a nice guy to get votes, political votes. He didn't say that. He said, if I had not helped, I would feel bad. Well, here's the question. If Lincoln were totally self-centered, why would he feel bad if he didn't help the pigs? Well, the suggestion that Rachel's has is, if he would feel good from helping the pigs and bad from not helping, we should probably conclude that he valued the welfare of those pigs. You know, a lot of people are happy to see animal rescues, even if they themselves are not doing the rescuing. Think of Free Willy. Think of all the videos of animal rescues. Think about them. Think about, and I like watching them. I even like watching videos of animals rescuing other animals, by the way. You can see videos like that, too, on YouTube. But the fact is, people very often enjoy seeing animals helped, and they're all over YouTube, by the way. Right? Um, but my point is that uh, people seem to have concern for others and even non-human animals, uh, and they seem to have concern for them even beyond what we would normally call would be self-interest. Now I know that life is complicated, and I know that we have multiple motives, and we can have overlapping motives, and I know that when people are rescuing pets, or I know, let's for example, when people have pets, that they, they, they grow normally to love their pets, but they also value the pets because the, the, the pets give them pleasure. I understand that. So we can have mixed motives. We understand this. But notice, Rachel is saying that Lincoln helped those pigs because it's reasonable to believe that Lincoln cared about something uh, other than just himself. And if Lincoln would feel bad by not helping, that's because he already valued those pigs. So Rachel says that particular example is an example with Lincoln. It's an example that doesn't really strengthen the universal generalization that says we're always self-centered called psychological egoism. If anything, it should lead us to question that universal generalization. So again, Rachel says sometimes we do the right thing uh, and that's what we're motivated to do, even when we believe doing the right thing may make us, may be unpleasant for us and may detract from uh, what will maximize our uh, pleasure. Okay? And so sometimes we have certain ideals and certain values and we say, I'm going to do the right thing, but I admit it's going to be very unpleasant. It's going to be unpleasant, but it's the right thing to do. But in any event, so Rachel's maintains that psychological egoism embodies a false overgeneralization. Okay, so he criticizes, if, if you were to change it and say most people most of the time are very largely self-interested, Rachel would have no problem with that. And by the way, I want to make another uh, point. Rachel's distinguishes between self-interested behavior and selfish behavior. Now, selfish, the word selfish typically is a thumbs down or pejorative word. It's a put down. And Rachel says to the degree that it's actually describing something, it seems to be describing behavior that, that would generally be described as uh, harmful to others. In other words, behavior that somehow sets back other people's interests, uh, unacceptably sets back other people's interests. Whereas self-interested behavior won't necessarily do that. It may even conceivably be uh, socially beneficial. What's an example of self-interested behavior? How about your t shoelace lo laces need to be tied? Okay? You're walking and then your shoelaces uh, are no longer tied. You tie them. That typically is in your self-interest, isn't it? Or you regularly work out at your gym. You regularly exercise. That's self-interested behavior typically. Uh, though it could in fact be beneficial to others as well. If you're in a better mood, if you're taking better care of your health, then that means you could be drawing uh, less money for, from our medical dollars, from the government-sponsored uh, medical, uh, medi medical care. 
uh, and that could mean you could be saving other people insurance premiums uh, and if you're healthier and fitter then perhaps you could function more effectively within your family so you're taking care of your health and your fitness could be largely self-interested yet that could be something that's socially beneficial okay your your being in a good mood can can really be in your interest but it can also be socially beneficial right uh, you're acquiring marketable skills can be in your self-interest but also socially beneficial so self-interested behavior need not adversely affect others in fact it's quite possible that it could either be morally neutral when it comes to affecting others or it could actually be socially beneficial and so Rachel makes these distinctions but he says typically if we're calling something selfish we're implying that people shouldn't do it and it, it typically means that you're either actively uh, unacceptably thwarting other people's desires okay as when you defraud people or you are not sufficiently attentive to people's desires when you should be as when somebody could be throwing a rope to a person drowning and the person doesn't because the person at the time is eating it has gone to a Taco Bell is eating a chalupa and uh, believes that the worst thing in the world is to uh, consume a, uh, uh, a cold chalupa so the person's eating the chalupa and the person's on a pier and there's someone who can't swim falls in uh, the water falls into the water uh, and the person says help me help me throw that rope throw that flotation device whatever and then the person eating the chalupa says sorry I don't want to eat my, a cold chalupa well a lot of people say well that is selfish and you shouldn't do that you shouldn't do that so anyway so Rachel says that typically selfish behavior is unacceptably self focused okay but he says uh, self interest behavior need not be it, it could be morally neutral as when you're tying your shoes or it could be uh, socially beneficial as when uh, you are entertaining millions of people I mean think of Oprah Winfrey uh, that can be socially beneficial and yet uh, when she was entertaining or has been entertaining millions of people it also can be self-interested so in any event uh, so okay so now we want to look at Rachel's what he discusses ethical what he calls ethical egoism which is also known as rational egoism okay so ethical or rational egoism is saying that we should uh, pursue our own self-interest and that should be our, our principal focus our ultimate focus okay that is a prescriptive or normative theory which is to say it is prescribing or recommending behavior rather it's talking about what should be rather than purporting to talk about what is so if you think about ethical rational egoism it's setting up again a standard it is recommending behavior or if you like it is creating a standard of what people ought to do it refers to what ought to be or what should be instead of saying what is or purporting to describe what is and so now there are different forms of ethical or rational egoism Rachel discusses the two most popular forms one is universal slash uh, impersonal ethical egoism and what does that say again ethical and rational egoism where I'm using these terms terms interchangeably that says the universal form of ethical egoism or if you like the impersonal form of it says that all people should promote their enlightened self-interest and normally that implies long-term happiness and uh, by the way it, it that sounds a lot like personal morality doesn't it in uh, in Harry Brown and by the way that probably sh sounds a lot like uh, the rational egoism uh, in uh, Ayn Rand a y n r a n d Ayn Rand was a very famous um, she was a philosopher but she was a novelist uh, essayist and she was the most famous defender of ethical slash rational egoism and, and and she believed that all people should promote their enlightened self-interest but she believed uh, that in a qualified way because she like Harry Brown believed that there are moral limits on what someone can do in the name of self-interest she believed that people have rights to life liberty and property uh, and that that people 
should not believe that uh, that they are entitled to other people's uh, the fruits of other people's labor. She did not believe that uh, she believed rather that uh, we are responsible for ourselves and that to the extent that we have some kind of disability and we can't uh, take care of ourselves that that should be done by uh, friends, family, and private charities. But I don't want to go into that right now. But I do want to say that Ayn Rand, like Harry Brown, that, uh, that each of those is an example of a, an ethical or rational egoist of the universal or impersonal kind. So let's look first at, um, at Rachel's discussion of universal ethical egoism. Okay, so that says that all people should pursue their enlightened self-interest slash personal ha long-term personal happiness. Okay. And Rachel says that this theory is unworkable whenever we have conflicting interests among individuals who are interacting. Let me say that again. Rachel says the theory of universal ethical egoism will be unworkable whenever you have conflicts of interest among individuals who are interacting. Now when we say unworkable, what is he, what we, when I say unworkable, as a paraphrase of what he's talking about, what, what is meant here? Well, he's saying that the theory will lead to practical inconsistencies or contradictions whenever you have two or more persons interacting with conflicting interests. Okay, so for example, Suppose it's in someone's interest to defraud another person, but it's not in the uh, per other person's interest to be defrauded. Okay, well, that makes sense. Um, whose interest should prevail? Harry Brown says, well, the theory really can't tell us within its own terms because it says that each person should pursue his uh, or her enlightened self-interest. And it could be in someone's enlightened self-interest to defraud someone, and then it would be in someone else's enlightened self-interest to prevent uh, his or her being defrauded. Uh, now, this, by the way, Rachel's even gives an example of a, a guy who is a, a firebug, uh, who, in other words, it's a, a person who enjoys setting fires to other people's property. And get, it's kind of like, almost like a sexual thing. Uh, and that the person, he goes, it may be in that person's interest to set fire to a building, even if there are people in it. Now I think that that I think it's unlikely to be in someone's best interest to do it, but I understand his point. His point is if the person's sufficiently clever and is very unlikely to get caught, uh, and if the person has some very peculiar desires, he's saying, couldn't it be in somebody's best interest to set fire to a building even with people in it? Uh, and I understand his point. And so his point is, isn't that a good example of immoral behavior? And when we talk about its immorality, we say it's immoral not principally or even maybe not at all because it's not in the self-interest of person um, setting the fire. Rather, we believe it's wrong because of the effect that has on others, including the owners of the building and the people in the building. Uh, we say, well, it's wrong because of its effect on others. And we believe that some things are wrong because of the effects on others even if the what is happening may have a positive effect on the agent creating the harm. Okay, so Rachel's is saying that that the position of of universal slash impersonal ethical egoism uh, will lead to practical inconsistencies whenever there are conflicts of interest among people who are interacting. Okay. Now, what's going to happen is Ayn Rand is going to deny this, right? Ayn Rand was, a, was an ethical egoist of the universal or impersonal sort. And now Ayn Rand believed that if you're a rational egoist, then there, are, there already are moral constraints on what you can do because she believed that you could have a defensible theory of individual moral rights. And she believed, so her, her ethical egoism includes the idea that people need to believe they're not entitled to the unearned, that people need to believe they're responsible for themselves, that people are responsible to cr create uh, tradable values, and that and people 
uh, don't have a right to violate others' rights to life, liberty, or property. I could go on and on. But the, the point is that Ayn Rand believed that uh, that an ethical egoist who's rational won't be the kind of person who will just go out and set a fire because a person uh, Im impulsively would get pleasure out of doing so. Um, and she thinks also, or thought, it was in our interest to get along with other people, to form mutually beneficial relationships, whether it's romantic or business relationships or any other relationships. And so she believed that uh, what we need is to create a system in which we can pursue individual self-interest in, in socially beneficial ways. And she thought that the market system is part of what, what that would be. Um, but in any event, all I'm going to do right now is tell you that Rachel thinks that there is no such thing as a, a rational egoism that can properly value individual moral rights. And, and these matters, unfortunately, are not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to resolve them uh, in this course. Uh, all I can say is uh, people who are uh, students of Ayn Rand who accept her a philosophy typically do believe that there are ways in which one could uh, adhere to a uh, well-defined uh, moral theory of individual rights that will put effective limits on what people can do in the name of self-interest. Um, all I can say right now, we're not going to be able to uh, settle any of this, all I can say is I think Ayn Rand looked at things like not only the marketplace, but but think of it. Like, so think of professional. Think of sports in general. Think of team sports, where you have people cooperating, and yet you also have competition. Right? You have people cooperating, uh, and they find it pleasurable to compete at the same time. And so, there are limits on what people can do in sports to score points. There are limits. There are certain things that are out of bounds, uh, and. Uh, even in, uh, in poker, where there's concealment and deception, uh, there's still ways that, that are impermissible ways of cheating in poker, let's say. But anyway, the point is that Ayn Rand believed that uh, it is possible to have a theory of individual moral rights that will set limits on what individuals uh, are free to pursue uh, in the name of uh, their self-interest. But all I'm telling you is that, that typically critics of ethical egoism don't believe it is possible for there to be uh, a rational egoism that can place effectively place limits on individual action in such a way that people won't clearly flout other people's rights or mistreat other people. Okay. Now, so that's Rachel's on ethical, uh, universal uh, ethical egoism. Okay. So then, what's the other form of egoism he discusses? Well, there's a third form, right? There's psychological egoism, there's universal ethical egoism, and then there's personal ethical egoism. Personal ethical egoism. Uh, what would be an example? Well, suppose Popeye the sailor man is a personal ethical egoist. Then that means that Popeye believes that he, Popeye, should promote his enlightened self-interest, but he doesn't believe that other people, including olive oil, uh, should promote uh, their self-interest. So uh, if he believed that everybody should promote uh, their self-interest or his or her self-interest, then he would be a universal ethical egoist. Right? Now, Rachel's criticizes personal ethical egoism, but not be on logical grounds because he thinks it can lead to any kind of inconsistency. He doesn't. He thinks rather it should be criticized on moral grounds as possibly motivating motivating uh, morally unacceptable behavior. Because Rachel thinks that if Popeye, he doesn't mention Popeye the Sailor Man, I'm mentioning him, but, but if someone, let's just say Popeye the Sailor Man, is always acting egoistically, uh, he's saying that such a person could end up mistreating others simply for his or her own benefit. So Rachel criticizes personal ethical egoism not on logical grounds by saying that it could lead to uh, self practical self-contradiction when you have two or more persons interacting with conflicting interests. He does, so he, he says instead that anyone who's constantly acting egoistically and has decided to unconditionally act egoistically could end up harming other people without sufficient justification. Interestingly, Rachel thinks 
that one would have to be more or less a sociopath to always act egoistically uh, because he thinks most people have something of a conscience and would not have the conscience or the stomach to always act egoistically. Okay? So I want you to know that. I want you to know that Rachel thinks that to the extent that someone really understands personal ethical egoism, that most people would not accept it and would not use it as a, an unconditional guide to their action because he believes that most people have at least some concern for others, even strangers, with which personal ethical egoism is incompatible. So again, Rachel's rejects universal ethical egoism on, if you like, logical grounds by saying that it can lead and will lead to practical inconsistencies whenever there are conflicting interests among two or more persons interacting. Furthermore, Rachel's rejects personal ethical egoism not on logical grounds, not on grounds of inconsistency, but rather because Rachel's believes that personal ethical egoism can motivate action that is morally unacceptable, in which someone is mistreating others simply for his or her own benefit. Now let me try to clarify this still further. Rachel's, when Rachel's disagrees with universal ethical egoism. What he's saying is he thinks that it's not a workable theory uh, because what it's saying is that everybody, everybody at the same time should always promote his or her enlightened self-interest. Rachel says that's simply not possible because there will be times when we're interacting with others when if we we, we just couldn't all effectively promote our enlightened self-interest because sometimes what would be in one person's self-interest could be in the detriment of someone else. And Rachel's believes that a sound ethical theory should help us iron out social conflict, should help us resolve conflicts of interest, and he thinks that universal ethical egoism will not do that. If anything, it will intensify conflicts of interest. Now remember, Rachel's doesn't believe that it is possible to create uh, a uh, universal ethical egoism that can adequately respect individual rights so that it doesn't lead to these practical inconsistencies whenever there are conflicting interests among two or more persons interacting. Okay, so to sum up, to sum up, Rachel criticizes every form of ethical egoism he discusses. Not just ethical egoism, but every form of egoism. He criticizes psychological egoism, which says that all people always do what they believe uh, will promote their self-interest. He criticizes that by saying that is an overgeneralization. He sa Rachel says sometimes people do what they believe is right, even knowing that that'll be a, a personal cost, possibly great personal cost. Okay, second, Rachel also criticizes universal ethical egoism by saying that it will lead to practical inconsistencies whenever two or more individuals interact with conflicting interests. Lastly, Rachel criticizes personal ethical egoism by saying that that theory that that theory can motivate action that is uh, socially, or not just socially, but morally unacceptable. Action in which some individual is harming others simply for his, uh, unjustifiably, simply for his or her own benefit. Again, the other stuff that you'll need to know, and we'll go over this uh, when we go over the review for the third test, is you'll need to know things such as what is, how does Rachel distinguish self-interested behavior from selfish behavior? And I mentioned before that according to Rachel's, you're acting selfishly when you are mistreating others, either by actively thwarting their desires, as you would be if you defrauded others, or you are simply ignoring their uh, vital interests uh, when you uh, shouldn't be, as when somebody lets a stranger drown when the person can easily throw a rope to that uh, drowning person. But anyway, so that's pretty much what I wanted to cover uh, in this lecture. And you need to understand that Rachel's is criticizing 
again, all, every form of egoism he discusses. What, and I didn't mention this about Harry Brown, but it looks as if Harry Brown, on some level, is not only a universal ethical egoist, but it looks as if Harry Brown may also be a psychological egoist because he seems to uh, be implying or saying that people are, are generally doing what they believe is in their uh, self-interest, but they're, they, they are confused because they, uh, in other words, they're confused about it because they're often doing things that really won't effectively promote their self-interest. And sometimes they accept a, a moral code that tells them not to promote their self-interest. But he thinks that generally people are trying to be happy um, as best, well, I don't know as best they can, but they're trying to be happy. Uh, but again, I don't want to go too deeply into that, except it, that Rachel's has an, an essay that is really, it's placed where it is in our book at, to conflict with um, the views of Brown. Okay, and again, I want you to know what Brown means by, well, we talked about this in the last lecture. You need to know what Brown means by personal morality. But what he means by personal morality seems to be what Rachel talks about as universal ethical egoism, by the way. Again, I want to remind you of that. But anyway, so we're going to go over all of this before the uh, the next test, that is to say the third test. That's pretty much what I wanted to cover for today's lecture.